Hi, it's Chris Flanagan here. Welcome to the Pediatric Emergencies Podcast. I do have more pediatric critical care pearls for you, and I hope to get episode three out in the next few weeks. But I want to take a bit of a break from the pediatric critical care pearls and do something slightly different today. So today I want to talk about preparation for intubation and the use of pre-intubation checklists. So over the last year, um, I've set up a course in Northern Ireland covering the basics of paediatric intubation. And as part of that course, I do a talk on preparation for intubation and use of checklists. So this is that talk um, summarised into a podcast. Um, I have devised a pre-intubation checklist, um, which I'm going to make available on the website, paediatricemergencies.com. So feel free to download it and use it in your own department and you can drop me some comments and let me know what you think about it. Okay, so I'm going to get started with the talk. Um, The checklist acts as a summary of the talk and you can see there's three main parts to preparing for intubation. You need to prepare the patient, you need to prepare your equipment and you need to prepare the team. So I'm going to talk about each of these in turn, starting off with preparing the patient. So preparing the patient starts off with your pre-intubation assessment and this is really an information gathering exercise. You're trying to find out a bit of information about your patient. Um, It's basic information you need such as their past medical history, what medicines they're on, but really you're trying to build up a picture as to whether this is going to be a difficult intubation. And when I say difficult intubation, most people think of difficult anatomical intubation. Um, That's a child where when you actually look with laryngoscopy, you're going to have a difficult view and difficulty passing the tube. But actually there's three types of uh, difficult intubation that you may have, and anatomical difficulties only make up one of them. Um, You can have difficulty because of cardiovascular instability, and you can have difficulty because of situational problems. I'll talk a little bit about each of them. So starting with anatomical difficulties, um, as we've said, this is where you've difficulty either getting a view or passing the endotracheal tube. And part of your pre-intubation assessment is about predicting this. And this involves a combination of history and examination. So from a history point of view, you should be looking back through the old notes, looking at previous anaesthetic charts, seeing did people have any difficulty intubating the child in the past. If they did, what did they do that was successful? Um, So you're starting off from that point rather than starting off from scratch. Um, What was their previous grade of laryngoscopy? Even if the child wasn't a difficult intubation in the past, there's useful information to be gained from looking at the notes. Um, you know, what size of endotracheal tube was the right size? What length was the right length on chest x-ray? Was there any drugs that caused problems for the child? And then on examination, you want to look and see does the child have any features that may make them a difficult anatomical intubation, such as micronathia, limited mouth opening, um, limited movement of the neck. Um, and there are certain syndromes, for example, peri sequence, Um, which notoriously have difficult airways. Um, Predicting the difficult airway is a whole separate talk, so this is something I'll try and get uploaded at a later stage. Okay, so moving on to the second reason you may have difficulty with intubation, and this is actually the one that worries me the most, uh, and that's difficulties due to cardiovascular instability. So you need to predict patients that are likely to have cardiovascular instability on induction of anaesthesia. And the group of patients that really fit into this category are your septic children or patients with congenital heart disease. So in these children, generally the process of putting the endotracheal tube in isn't technically difficult. Um, But the problem is that when you give them an anaesthetic, they're highly likely to drop their cardiac output and are at risk of arresting. So again, I do a separate talk on intubation in special circumstances and I'll, I'll make sure I get this uploaded as a separate podcast, talking through the special steps you need to take when you're dealing with one of these children. Um, And the third reason you may have a difficult intubation is due to situational reasons. Um, I think of a common example of this would be when you're having to intubate outside your normal environment. 
um, you're called down to a ward to deal with a child in cardiac arrest. Um, you don't have time to prepare your equipment in advance. You don't have your skilled airway system with you. Um, there's vomit in the airway. There's there's not a yanker sucker ready. Um, you're handed a laryngoscope in two pieces. So the situation makes the uh, intubation difficult. Um, but normally, that child doesn't have an anatomically difficult airway. And while all situational problems can't be avoided, um, you certainly can try and minimise some of their impact. So for example, training and simulation um, in different environments, making sure you take a trained airway assistant and your own equipment with you if you're going to a remote location. And actually looking at, do I really need to intubate this child on the paediatric ward? Would I not be better moving them up to the intensive care unit if I can and doing the intubation there? So there's certainly a few things you can look at and human factors are particularly important when dealing with a situationally difficult airway. So next thing you want to look at, is my child adequately fasted? And when I say adequately fasted, um, what you're hoping is that the child has an empty stomach and is at low risk then of aspiration during the process of intubation. Um, and there is a simple rule you can remember um, to decide whether your child is or isn't adequately fasted, and it's the 246 rule. So it's two hours for clear fluids, four hours for breast milk, um, and six hours for formula or cow's milk or solid food. And it is important to mention that even if your child meets these fasting rules, it doesn't guarantee that they have an empty stomach. Um, critically ill children, um, their stomach doesn't empty as normal. So even if they have met these rules, they still may have a full stomach. Um, and certainly I've intubated children who have been fasting for over 24 hours, um, but still when you put the nasogastric tube in, they've got a stomach full of bile or food contents. Um, so it doesn't guarantee an empty stomach if you've got a critically ill child. Um, the other group to look at is the children with um, bad gastroesophageal reflux. Um, and these children are at again at higher risk of aspiration. Um, so what do you do if your child doesn't meet the fasting rules or they fall into that critically ill group where they may not have an empty stomach? Um, and again, that's something I'm going to talk about in intubation in special circumstances. So it's coming as a separate talk um, about the precautions you should be taking if your child doesn't meet these rules. Um, the simple thing, if it's not an emergency intubation, you can wait until they are adequately fasted. Um, but if you do need to get on ahead and intubate them, there are some important steps you need to take. And like I say, I'll cover that in a separate talk. Okay, so um, moving on to pre-oxygenation. So what do I mean by pre-oxygenation? Um, so pre-oxygenation involves putting a tight-fitting face mask over the child's face, letting them breathe 100% oxygen for three minutes. Um, and what you're trying to do by this is you're trying to denitrogenize the lungs. You're trying to build up a reservoir of oxygen in the lungs so that when you have the apnea period during the intubation, you've got a supply of oxygen in the lungs. Um, oxygen moves across by diffusion. So even though the child is not being ventilated during the intubation attempt, the, you can still get oxygen from the lungs into the blood. And that buys you more time prior to critical desaturation than if you haven't pre-oxygenated the lungs. So I only deal with critically ill children as a paediatric intensivist. So for me, pre-oxygenating the lungs involves administration of PEEP. These children are critically ill. Um, parts of their lungs have started to collapse down with atelectasis. And as I've said, with pre-oxygenation, what you're trying to do is to build up a reservoir of oxygen in the lungs. So if I only give that child pure oxygen with no PEEP, all that I'm doing is filling up the parts of the lungs that are open with 100% oxygen and denitrogenizing those bits of the lungs. If I also administer PEEP, what I'm doing is recruiting the lungs up and actually providing a bigger space that can be filled up with 100% oxygen. So it is important that in critically ill children you use PEEP 
um, during your pre-oxygenation process. Um, and that can be whatever device you're comfortable with, be it a bag valve mask with a peep valve or one of the anaesthetic circuits, either an Erz T-piece or a Mapleson C circuit, for example. Um, it is important to mention that there may be some children that it wouldn't be appropriate to pre-oxygenate in 100% oxygen. Um, and to name a few, it would be, I suppose, children with duct-dependent congenital heart disease, where an administration of 100% oxygen may cause the duct to close. There's also certain groups in that, for example, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, where as well as closing the duct, um, it can cause other problems um, with pulmonary overcirculation and cardiovascular collapse if you pre-oxygenate these children. Um, and I suppose the other group is the extremely preterm neonates who are at risk of retinopathy or prematurity. Um, and again, I'll talk a little bit more about what you should do um, in intubation in special circumstances um, as a separate talk. Okay, moving on to positioning. So I think the first and uh, most important thing to say about positioning is have the patient in a position that's comfortable for you. So that involves having the bed at the right height and the patient's head close enough to you that you're not stretching. So the next thing you want to do is have the patient positioned in such a way that you're going to have the best view with laryngoscopy. Uh, and what you're trying to do is have all the, the oral axes, the pharyngeal axes and the tracheal axes all in a line so that when you look in with your laryngoscope you're going to get a view of the cords. And what you need to do in the different ages of children very slightly but there's one principle that unifies what you're attempting to do by positioning the patient and that is you want the tragus of the ear in line with the sternal notch in a vertical axis. So in, for example, neonates and young infants, to get them into this position quite often you have to put a little roll under the shoulders. So elevating the shoulders slightly, bringing the sternal notch up into line with the tragus of the ear. In sort of older, older infants and young children, quite often they'll naturally be in the right position when you check um, the level of the sternal notch with the triangles of the ear. Um, as children get older, you get into the teenagers and adolescents, um, the right position generally is to have a pillow under the head, bringing the head up and again raising the level of the ear in line with the sternal notch. In obese patients, you may need to use quite a few pillows and rolls to get the head elevated enough so that it's in line with the sternal notch. But you shouldn't be starting the intubation process until you have the patient in the right position because they need to be in that position so that when you look down the oral axes, it lines up with the pharyngeal axes and then lines up with the tracheal axes. And if your patient's not in that right position, the axes aren't going to line up. So it's going to make your process of getting a good view and then subsequently passing the tube much more difficult. So start every intubation with a check for positioning and if it's not right, fix it before moving on. Okay, moving on to vascular access. You need to have reliable working vascular access obviously to give the intubation medications. Um, and again, we'll talk about what medications you're going to give a little later on. Um, you don't want to find out that your axis has stopped working when your child has a bradycardia and you need to give them some atropine. So get the axis sorted out beforehand. Flush it and make sure it's working yourself before you proceed. Um, if you don't have good access and it doesn't look easy, remember interosseous access is easy to insert and is generally better than peripheral access for getting drugs into the central circulation. Okay, so the next thing you want to check is, do I need to optimise my patient's hemodynamics prior to proceeding with intubation? And, and this comes into that part of that initial assessment, is my patient likely to have a cardiovascular difficult intubation? And if so, you should optimise them prior to giving them an induction agent, which is likely to depress their cardiac output. And by optimising them, I mean you should give them some fluid, so you're improving their preload and consider whether you need to start a peripheral vasoactive drug um, prior to inducing anaesthesia. 
Um, and almost certainly if I'm intubating a, a septic patient, they tend to get a fluid bolus immediately prior to intubation and generally I have them on some peripheral adrenaline, which I've made sure has reached the patient prior to they get their induction agent. So we often intubate patients to improve their hemodynamics and while in the midterm it does improve hemodynamics, that actual process of intubating the patient and um, giving them a drug which will depress their cardiac output in an induction agent and switching from negative pressure to positive pressure ventilation which impairs preload will initially make the cardiovascular instability worse. So if you're not starting out from a good place you need to fix it before intubating the patient. Um, if you don't fix it things will likely get worse before you can hope they get better with the positive effects of uh, positive pressure ventilation. So I do have um, separate talks available on the website on the use of uh, push dose pressors and peripheral vasoactive drugs and also in the sepsis podcast um, I talk about the preparation for intubation in a cardiovascularly unstable patient. So um, the one of the, the last things you need to do in preparing the patient is to aspirate their nasogastric tube if they do have one in situ. It just makes sense if you have one in, um, even though your patient may be adequately fasted, they still may have gastric juices in their stomach which are at risk of coming up and causing aspiration. So if you have a nasogastric tube in, aspirate before you proceed. If you don't have a nasogastric tube in, I wouldn't necessarily recommend you do put one in pre-intubation because that actual process of putting the tube in to um, aspirate the stomach may cause the patient to vomit at a time where often they're struggling from a respiratory point of view and that added vomit may make things just so much worse. So if the tube's in, certainly aspirate it before you proceed. But I'm not saying you must put one in um, and whether you do or don't decide to put a nasogastric tube in has to be made of on an individual situation weighing up the risks and benefits. Okay, so that was preparing the patient. Um, the next bit I want to go on to is preparing the equipment. So on the back of the pre-intubation checklist, there is an equipment list, so it contains all the bits that you're going to need to do a paediatric intubation. So you can prepare these in advance, but I'm going to go through things bit by bit, starting off with the monitoring. So there is a minimum standard of monitoring that you should have on um, prior to intubation. Um, and I don't think any of us would try and intubate a patient um, without oxygen saturations. But there is a few important points about the where you position the saturation probe. Um, most importantly, the SATS probe should not be on the same limb as the blood pressure. Because at a critical moment, as the blood pressure cuff goes up, you'll lose your SATS tracing. And you're not sure, is it because the patient's deteriorated or the blood pressure cuff has gone up? Likewise, it's important to make sure you've got a good trace on your SATS monitor prior to starting the intubation because if you don't have a good pulse trace, the SATS reading is likely to be inaccurate. Um, it's important you have the ECG on. Um, your patient's at risk of arrhythmias because of the drugs you're giving them, particularly bradycardia, which is likely to be vaguely induced, so you need to know about it. And another useful tip is to turn the pulse tone on on the monitor. Um, this is the beep, beep. Beep, with, with each beep being the heartbeat, and the actual tone of the beeps tells you about the oxygen saturations. So without even looking at the monitor, you'll know what the heart rate and saturations are. So really useful tip. Um, your blood pressure cuff um, should be on and cycling every minute in the absence of an arterial line during the intubation. Like I've said, there's a number of reasons why the patient may decompensate on intubation you need to know about it. And it's really important that you have some way of confirming that your tube is in the trachea via capnography. And there's a couple of methods you can use to do this. There's either the colometric devices, which change colour when exposed to carbon dioxide, or there's the continuous waveform devices. Um, and for me, I'm always using the waveform device because it gives you an awful lot more information and causes fewer problems than the colometric devices. So by the waveform device, um, 
on your monitor you'll get a lot of more information so you'll get a, a normal waveform of carbon dioxide and you'll actually get a value of the end tidal reading of carbon dioxide on the monitor which most of the time correlates fairly well with the PiCO2. So you're getting a lot more information with the continuous waveform capnography. Um, you get certain patterns in different conditions, for example, like asthma, malignant hyperthermia, um, and you can actually monitor trends in the end tidal CO2, which you can't do with the colorimetric devices. They just tell you, is there CO2 there or not? Um, there's also less problems with um, false negatives with the with the waveform devices um, particularly in small babies and um, babies who have a low cardiac output um, they may not generate enough co2 to turn the colorimetric device to change color so even though your tube is in the trachea there may not be enough co2 to induce a reaction and change the color on that device with the continuous waveform devices, I've intubated lots of children in cardiac arrest who've been in cardiac arrest for quite some time. And although the end tidal CO2 rating is quite low, it may be 0.8, 0.6, you do get a normal waveform on the monitor, so you can be sure your tube is in. The other false negative that um, both of the devices can have is if they become damp or contaminated with secretions, they may not change colour. Um, the uh, continuous waveform device, the sampling line, can, can become blocked easily by the secretions. So even though your tube's in, it may not read. So again, important thing to know. You will get less false positives with the continuous waveform device. Um, and the particular situation I'm thinking of is the child who's had carbonated drinks prior to intubation. If you actually do an esophageal intubation in that child, because there's CO2 in the stomach, the colorimetric device will change color exactly the same as if it was in the trachea. If you've got the waveform device, um, although there's CO2 in the stomach, it will show up on the monitor, but it will be a very abnormal trace. And with each breath, you'll notice that the level of CO2 goes down and down and down. So it's very clear quite quickly, even if you've done an esophageal intubation, that the pattern is not normal and it disappears quite quickly with the waveform with the colorimetric device you get exactly the same thing as if you've intubated um, the trachea um, the other big advantage of the waveform device is actually in prior to intubating the patient so what i would recommend is you have this in the circuit prior to intubation when the patient's breathing spontaneously they'll gener still be generating co2 as long as you've got a good seal on the mask and this will show up in the monitor. As the patient goes off to sleep and for example the tone in the airway decreases and the airway may become obstructive as you bag them, um, you'll lose the CO2 trace. You make a few adjustments and open the airway up again and bag the CO2 trace will come back again. So in this setting you're using the CO2 trace to assess the adequacy of the ventilation during that bagging period prior to the intubation. So a really useful um, tip is to have that in the circuit um, pre-induction. And it will help you decide whether you're actually ventilating your patient effectively during that period. Um, one more tip I would have is most of the circuits have an angle piece that then connects onto the mask. And what I would recommend, you position your end tidal um, circuit behind the angle piece. So you have the, the circuit, the end tidal CO2, then the angle piece, then the mask. Because when you're switching over from the mask to the endotracheal tube, it's really common if you have the end tidal CO2, the other end of the angle piece, that it gets left out, it's still attached to the mask whenever it's connected to the endotracheal tube. And then you have to disconnect again, waste another five seconds to try and determine is your tube in the right spot. Whereas you have it slightly further back in the circuit, away from the disconnection, it always stays in the circuit. Okay, so moving on to oxygen. It goes without say that you need oxygen to intubate the patient. Um, for most of us in the hospital environment, this is going to be mains oxygen via blender. So check your blender set to 100%, provided it's not contraindicated. 
turn up your flow um, adequate to what you need for your circuit and check that it's working prior to using it. Um, it is important that you have an oxygen cylinder as backup um, and certainly where I work there's a cylinder in every bed um, as a backup should means oxygen fail. You need a face mask, um, size it, make sure it's the right size for your patient even if you don't intend to use it. Um, a lot of our children come to the unit intubated orally and provided it's not contraindicated we generally change the tube over to a nasal tube on admission. So my plan A is to change the tube from oral to nasal. I don't need a face mask for that, but I still must have a face mask in case plan A doesn't work and the nasal tube doesn't go in and we do need to bag the patient. So it has to be sized. Um, a lot of the face masks have a little valve on it, which you can use a normal IV syringe to add extra air should there not be enough air in the cuff of the face mask. And then you need some sort of circuit to ventilate your patient with. Um, and you will need to ventilate your critically ill child prior to intubation. In adults, they tend to do a rapid sequence induction where the patient is pre-oxygenated. Um, sometimes with a non-rebreather mask, um, they're given the induction agent, the muscle relaxant, and then they're not bagged during that apnea period while the muscle relaxant takes effect and then the patient's intubated and only given positive pressure ventilation following intubation. In children, if you try to do that, they will desaturate well before you even started to intubate them. So you always have to bag them during the apnea period. And this is critically ill children I'm talking about. So a non-rebreather mask is absolutely useless. Um, and like I've said in the bit on pre-oxygenation, you want to be pre-oxygenating with PEEP. Um, so you do have a few options for this. Um, you can use a standard bag valve mask, um, provided you've got a PEEP valve in it. Um, or you can use one of the um, circuits, for example, an ERS T-piece or a Mapleson C circuit. And I much prefer the um, circuits to the bag valve mask um, because you, it gives you a better feel uh, and you can titrate the PEEP much easier as you've got a feel of the bag and, and how the patient is moving air. And we tend to use an urge T piece under about 20 kilos and then for above 20 kilos a Mapleson C circuit. Um, certainly the bag valve mask is useful in the pre-hospital environment um, where oxygen supply is limited. Um, and that's why even if you're planning to use one of the circuits you must have a bag valve mask as well because should oxygen fail, your circuit won't work. Whereas a bag valve mask will work perfectly well in air. So the next thing you need is a Goodell airway. I'm not gonna go through the sizing or how it's inserted because that's standard on all the resuscitation courses that people attend. But when people go out the doors, the resuscitation courses, they quite often forget about the Goodell airway. And it's a really, really useful bit of kit. Um, what tends to happen um, as the children are going off to sleep, um, the airway tone is lost. So there's a bit of a rush while people try a few different manoeuvres, maybe a two-handed technique. Um, and then they're still struggling. They can't get the child adequately ventilated. So what tends to happen is people rush on ahead and proceed to the intubation prior to the muscle relaxant having a good effect. So you intubate the patient when you don't have good intubating conditions and you're already using up that supply of oxygen in the lungs. So your alternative technique is you just put a good deal airway in, you reoxygenate the patient, um, you let the muscle relaxant work and you intubate them. So uh, the second approach for me is much better, but most people don't do this. Um, but I'm seeing lots of juniors intubating. The first approach is what happens. They struggle, they rush to intubate. Whereas if they just had a simple Goodell airway in, it brings control back to the whole procedure. So really the only thing I want to say about Goodell airways is use them. They're a really useful bit of kit and you should have an appropriately sized one for every intubation. And just a quick note to say that uh, nasopharyngeal airways, while they're very useful in other situations, 
in this situation where you're just trying to open the airway up um, in a patient that you're providing positive pressure ventilation for, a Goodell airway is much more useful and less likely to cause problems. So you should be using a Goodell over a nasopharyngeal airway. Um, the nasopharyngeal airway is likely to cause trauma. It's more difficult to insert. And certainly if you add blood to the field, it's going to make the intubation more difficult. So Goodell, use it. Nasopharyngeal airway, yes, in other situations, really useful bit of kit, but not for this situation. Um, moving on, so suction. Make sure you've checked the suction prior to using it. Have it turned on and have a large bore yanker sucker on the end of it. And I generally have this positioned um, under the pillow or um, just under the mattress on the right hand side of the patient so that it's always in the same place for me. Um, when I want it, I can reach down uh, without taking my eyes off the airway and grab hold of the suction. Um, I don't get somebody to pass this to me because generally it's, I have to then look up, it's not passed to me in the right way. Um, an intubation is about doing, making it boring, doing the same thing every time. So position your equipment the same way. Um, while I've said you must have a, a yanker sucker on the end of the suction catheter when you're doing the intubation, um, you should still have a, an appropriate sized soft flexible suction catheter. Um, and this is used after you put the endotracheal tube into the trachea. A lot of these children you're intubating because of secretions in the chest and respiratory failure. So great, you've put the endotracheal tube in, but you haven't really fixed the problem. Now you've got a passage down to the chest. It makes sense to go down and clear out those secretions that were giving you the problem. So it's one of the first things I'll often do after intubating a patient. Even if I'm planning to change a tube from oral to nasal, I'll stop at the stage of putting the oral tube in, put some saline down the tube, do some bagging and suctioning prior to proceeding with whatever else I want to do with the patient. So don't forget about it. Um, and you will need a nasogastric tube and an enteral syringe um, as part of your equipment. Like I said, you may or may not have a nasogastric tube in situ but it is important that you do have one in the bed space when you're doing an intubation. So when you provide face mask ventilation, your intentions are that all the air will go down into the lungs, but in practice, um, a lot of the air goes down into the stomach. Um, this can distend the abdomen, splint the diaphragm, and particularly in small babies, make ventilation very, very difficult. So you may need to put the nasogastric tube in in a hurry to decompress the abdomen and allow you to ventilate the child effectively. So must have it regardless of whether you put it in or not at the start. If you're using a cuff tube, you need a, a normal IV syringe to go on the end and to inflate the cuff. And you should have some lubricant available to lubricate the tube. Um, a lot of people think that you only need to lubricate the tube if you're putting a nasal tube in and they feel the lubricant is to help the tube get down the nose. But the, part of the reason for lubricating the tube is to help it slide easily through the vocal cords into the trachea without causing trauma. So you should lubricate the tube um, even if it's just going to be an oral tube. So um, coming on to the tubes themselves, um, like I say, if you're using a cuff tube, it's important you check the cuff prior to insertion. Um, there's no point putting a tube in to realize afterwards the cuff's burst and then you have to redo the intubation. Um, and in general, you should have a tube one size bigger and one size smaller than the one you think is the right size. And I'll come on to the sizing in a minute. Um, while we're on the tubes, um, I think it's important to mention, you know, should we be using a cuff tube or a non-cuff tube? Um, and I have done a separate talk on cuffed versus uncuffed tubes and the evidence for their use in critically ill children. Um, in a summary of that, um, my personal view is that if you're intubating a critically ill child, you should put a cuffed endotracheal tube in, providing it's not contraindicated. And the contraindications are a child less than three kilos or a preterm neonate. But for everybody else, I'm using a cuffed tube. And the reason for that is, 
I want to intubate the child once um, and not have to go back and upsize the tube because there's a leak around it. And that's what a cuff tube lets you do. Um, there's always a leak around it when you put it in um, because that's the way it's designed. And you blow up the tube, or, or, sorry, you blow up the cuff and the leak disappears. With an uncuffed tube, it's designed to, to seal the cricoid um, and you use the formulas to help you decide the best tube to put in. But a lot of studies have shown that up to 30% of the time, you'll need to upsize the tube. So if you're intubating a critically ill child, it makes sense just to put one tube down without having to put them through an unnecessary intervention of upsizing that tube. And quite often that upsizing of the tube happens a few days later when the child has deteriorated significantly from a respiratory point of view. Because the tube goes down initially, the child's not on high pressures, um, high oxygen requirements, so they ventilate well without much of a leak. And people think the tube's adequately sized. But as the lungs deteriorate and the pressures on the ventilator are turned up, a leak develops and now the child is not adequately ventilating. So that very sick child, you have to then go in and do an emergency tube change in an unstable patient. So that's my reasons why I always put a cuff tube in if it's not contraindicated. Just one more point to say about cuff tubes. If you are using a cuff tube, it should be a micro cuff tube. It's the only tube designed for the paediatric airway and a lot of the other cuff tubes um, have a lot of faults which make them quite dangerous to use in children. So if you want to find out a bit more about that, have a look at the podcast I've done on cuffed endotracheal tubes in critically ill children. Um, a couple more things to point out about the tube. Um, you may have noticed that the endotracheal tubes have a bevel on them, so the end of them isn't straight. Um, and You may have wondered, what is that bevel for? Well, it serves a number of functions. Um, the first thing is it helps you get the tube into the trachea. You'll notice that the bevel is always over the left-hand side of the tube, and that's because you're, the tube is designed to be passed from the right-hand side. So it doesn't obstruct your view of the cords as it's going through, and it makes it more likely to pass through the cords um, due to the presence of the bevel. The bevel also comes in use when the endotracheal tube catches on the anterior tracheal rings. Um, if you look at the axes, the, 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 trachea, the trachea actually goes backwards. So when you pass the tube through the glottis, it often is passing anterior. So with, and if you've got a trachea that goes down the way, it often catches on the tracheal rings. So you do get a situation where you've intubated the patient, the tube is just through the cords, but it's catching. And that's because it's catching on those tracheal rings. So if, because the tube's got a bevel, if you rotate the tube um, anti-clockwise, the bevel just rolls off the tracheal rings and the tube then will advance into the trachea. So that's another situation where it can help you. The other thing I want to point out about the endotracheal tubes, you might have noticed a little hole on the sidewall of the endotracheal tubes um, and that's called a Murphy's eye. Um, and you, you may wonder what's the function of that. So if the main lumen of the tube becomes blocked, it's to allow ventilation via the tube or it can become blocked with a plug of secretions, or it can become blocked because the tip of the tube is up against the wall. And the final thing I want to say about endotracheal tubes is how you size them. So most people are familiar with the APLS formula, um, age over four plus four. Um, in neonates, generally uh, a baby less than a kilo should have a two and a half tube. Um, between a kilo and probably two and a half kilos, a size three on cuff tube is about right. Um, and once you get over two and a half kilos, a three and a half tube is about right. And then somewhere between about four and five kilos, you could think about a four on cuff tube. Um, looking at the length of insertion, um, again, there's the standard APLS formulas for older children, which is the length of the tube of the lips is age over two plus 12 and the length of the tube of the nose is age over two, plus 15. Um, in neonates and young infants, um, I found the formula weight plus six uh, as the length of the lips with an oral tube to be quite accurate, and weight plus seven 
at the length of the nose for a nasal tube to be very accurate. So it goes without saying that you will need a laryngoscope and it's important you check it's working prior to its use and that you also have a backup should your original laryngoscope fail. When it comes on to blade selection, um, we tend to generally use a straight blade um, for children, I suppose less than six months to a year. And over a year, we traditionally use a Mac blade for, for the intubation of these older children and adults. Um, and both these blades are designed to do a different job. The Miller blade is designed to go under the epiglottis and lift it directly, leaving you a view of the vocal cords. Whereas the straight blade is designed to slide in behind the epiglottis to the vallecula and indirectly lift the epiglottis out of the way. Um, and there is a reason why we use them in the age groups that I've mentioned. So in small infants um, and neonates, the children have a large floppy epiglottis and the little ligament, the glossoepiglottic ligament that joins the back of the tongue to the epiglottis is quite lax. And it's this ligament that lifts the epiglottis out of the way when you go into the vallecula with a Mac blade. So for those reasons, um, it's much better to use a straight blade in neonates and younger infants. Whereas once the epiglottis isn't as big and floppy and that ligament is not as lax in older children, a Mac blade uh, tends to be easier to use. But there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't use a straight blade in an older child as well. So while I've said in, in theory um, a straight blade should be better in neonates and younger infants, if you're somebody who uses a mat blade every day and only intubates neonates maybe once every couple of years, um, you could technically use a mat blade um, because the process of actually lifting an epiglottis directly with a straight blade can be a little tricky for those who are unfamiliar with it. You could put your Mac blade into the vallecula and you probably get a grade two view um, because you the ligaments will be lax and you won't lift the epiglottis completely out of the way. But combined with a little bit of external laryngeal manipulation, it's fairly easy to turn that grade two view into a grade one view. So it, it might be worth thinking about that if you're somebody who doesn't intubate children that regularly. The other thing you could actually do is start off with a straight blade. Um, by all means, try and lift the epiglottis out of the way. However, if you're having trouble with a straight blade, by all means, put it into the vallecula and combine it with an external laryngeal manipulation. And nine times out of ten, you'll get a good enough view that you can intubate with. So, really useful bit of kit that you should have for every intubation is a bougie. And a bougie is designed to actually intubate the trachea itself. And then what you should do is pass the endotracheal tube over the top of the bougie into the trachea and then take the bougie out. Um, there's three sizes of bougie available. There's a five French bougie, um, which is generally used for uh, an endotracheal tube of 3.5 millimeters internal diameter and less. The size 10 bougie is for an endotracheal tube beside a 4.0 and a 5.5 millimeter. And for an endotracheal tube with an internal diameter of 6 millimeters and greater, the, the normal adult 15 French bougie should fit. Um, so why would you use a bougie to intubate the patient with rather than just actually passing the endotracheal tube by itself? So the bougie is particularly useful when you don't have a good view of the airway. And running through the different grades of laryngoscopy, a grade one view is where you can see all the airway when you look in. A grade two view is you get a partial view of the airway opening. Grade three view is where you can just see the epiglottis but can't see any of the airway opening or the posterior airway cartilages. And a grade four view is you can't even see the epiglottis. So take the grade one view. Um, you probably don't need a bougie because the endotracheal tube should pass without any difficulty. 
And in this instance, you shouldn't be using a bougie on necessarily because there is a slightly higher risk of causing trauma if you do use it. Obviously, if you have a difficult passing the tube, the risks of causing trauma outweigh any risks of using the bougie. Take the grade two view, for example, where you've only got a partial view of the glottic opening. It might be hard to get the endotracheal tube um, below and up into the, the airway, whereas actually a thin bougie with its tip that's angled up the way will probably quite easily slip onto the epiglottis and into the airway, and then you can just railroad the endotracheal tube over the top of the bougie. Um, you'll see the bougie go into the airway so you can be certain it's in. And the important bit you're looking for is just the posterior cartilages, and if the bougie goes up above those, it's in the airway. Now the grade 3 um, view, where you can only see the epiglottis, this is where a bougie is particularly useful. So what you should do with a bougie is pass it blindly onto the epiglottis. You, if you know your airway anatomy, you'll know the, the airway should be directly um, underneath that epiglottis. So if you pass the bougie up and under where you expect the airway to be, how do you tell if it's gone into the airway rather than the esophagus? And there's two signs you're looking for. The first is clicks. And that's the bougie going over the anterior tracheal rings. Not always felt in a knee in it due to the, the size of the rings. And the other sign you'll get is hold up. Um, as the tube lodges in the bronchus, um, you get, you get a, a resistance to passing it. If you've gone into the esophagus, obviously there's no rings, so you don't feel clicks. And it passes just as easily as an nasogastric tube. So you won't get hold up, it'll pass right the way down into the stomach. Um, Obviously, if you see the bougie go in the grade 2 view, you shouldn't be trying to get clicks and hold up because you're sure it's in. Um, if you can't see it, then obviously that's the signs you need to look for. But like I say, using a bougie isn't without its risks, but if you've got a grade 3 airway that you need to intubate and can't intubate any other way, a bougie is a really useful bit of kit. Um, the grade 4 airway, grade, sorry, grade 4 airway, a bougie is going to be absolutely useless because you need to see the epiglottis um, to, for the bougie to be useful. Um, there's often a bit of a debate about whether you should use a bougie or a stylet. Um, for me, I much prefer a bougie. I think it's a much more useful bit of kit um, and less likely to cause trauma in the long term. And that's because if you want to use a stylet, you need to put the stylet into the endotracheal tube prior to the intubation attempt. So that means that you're using a stylet for 100% of your intubations. It makes the endotracheal tube stiffer and you're slightly more likely to cause trauma to the airway. Um, with a bougie, you, you have your endotracheal tube ready with nothing inserted in it, and 95% of the time, you'll just pass the tube by itself. And it's only for those 5% of intubations, which are slightly different, you ask for the bougie, and then exactly the same endotracheal tube goes over the top of the bougie. So that's why I prefer to use a bougie, but likewise, some people prefer stylets. Um, but the important thing is you've thought about what you want to use in advance and have it ready. Um, forceps. Um, there's a range of forceps used to pass a nasal tube into the airway, McGill's or Tilly's. Um, even if you're only planning an oral tube, um, they are useful because your patient could have a foreign body as a cause of respiratory distress and you may need to remove that from the airway. Endotracheal tube tips are important obviously to secure the tube and we tend to use tapes in children rather than ties. And if you're using a cuff tube, you should have a manometer to measure the cuff pressures. It's one of the rules that if you're going to use a cuff tube, you must be able to measure cuff pressures and generally they should be less than 20 um, to avoid overcoming capillary perfusion pressure and causing risk of um, airway ulceration and subsequent subglottic stenosis. You need a stethoscope um, to confirm your tubes in, in the chest and in the right place. And then you need some difficult airway kit or you need to know about the difficult airway kit. I'm not going to list all the bits of kit that should be in the difficult airway kit because it should come as a package and it's a package that you should be familiar with. You should be familiar with the algorithms of what you're going to do when intubation doesn't go to plan and you should have thought about what you're going to use and you should be familiar with what your department has. 
so like I say, I'm grouping this into one bit. It's a difficult array kit. It often comes in a trolley that you need to be familiar with and know what you're going to use. When we come on to drugs, you obviously need drugs. Um, there's three main groups of drugs you need to intubate a patient. Uh, the first is the induction agent, so it's what you give to put the patient off to sleep so that they don't feel what you're doing. Um, the second is the muscle relaxant, so it's what relaxes the airway tone, causes the cords to open and facilitates you passing the endotracheal tube. And then you need some rescue medications. Um, and in general, your rescue medications are atropine, because the patient's at risk of bradycardia from a number of um, vaguely induced stimuli. Um, you may need some fluid. Um, like I said, the, the process of changing from negative to positive pressure ventilation and the administration of induction agents, even in well children, can drop the blood pressure. Um, and the other thing to think about is, do you need some push dose pressors or push dose adrenaline? Um, should the patient drop their pressure um, and again I have a separate podcast um, covering that and how you mix those up. Okay so that's preparing the equipment. The final bit is preparing your team um, and that starts with a team briefing and that's all the people that are going to be involved in the intubation process. The first thing you need to do is assign roles. Um, so obviously you need a team leader. Um, and what I do need to say is that if you're leading things, you should not be the person doing the intubation. Um, I've said this before in some of the other podcasts, but there's a real risk of task fixation if you are leading and doing at the same time. You'll get fixated on the task that you're doing and you'll miss lots of what's going on. You'll miss the big picture. Um, and this is really, really dangerous. So if you're the person doing the intubation, you can't be leading it. So it's handed over to somebody else. And if I do find myself in a situation where I'm having to do the, the intubation because I'm the only person to do it, I'll ask somebody else to lead while I'm doing the intubation. And that can be a nurse. And I have done that in the past. I've asked a nurse to lead things with instructions while I'm doing the intubation. Once I'm done, I'll then take up the leadership role again, but I can't lead while I'm doing the intubation. I'm going to put a link to a couple of um, videos which really demonstrate the point um, in the show notes. So have a look at those uh, and I'm sure after watching those you'll agree 100% with me. So the team leader's role is to stand back, look at the whole patient, have an eye on the monitoring and lead the thing. If the, if the intubator is taking too long or struggling, to suggest alternative techniques or maybe even abandon the intubation procedure itself. The airway doctor one is the first person intubating and airway doctor two is the second person intubating. They generally should have more experience than airway doctor one. Um, the airway assistant, um, it's important you brief them on what you want them to do. Um, do you want them doing external laryngeal manipulation for you? Do they want them passing you your suction? So it's important they know in advance what they're doing, as well as simply just passing the tubes and equipment. Um, drug administration, you need a separate person to give the drugs. Importantly, that you've discussed the doses of what you want given. Do they know what to give in an emergency should the blood pressure drop? Um, nasogastric tube aspiration is a rule in itself. If you've got a tube in and you're doing face mask ventilation, even if you've aspirated the tube prior to starting, as you start bagging, the stomach will start filling up with air. So what you need is somebody just to continuously aspirate that tube during ventilation with a face mask and keep the tummy decompressed and reduce the risk of aspiration. If you want to use cricoid pressure, um, again, you need somebody to do that. Um, and if your patient needs their cervical spine immobilized, again, you'll need somebody to take on that role. So allocate all the roles in advance. And then the final bit of the team brief is planning for failure. Um, so it's anticipating what could go wrong, what action should we take um, if it does go wrong, can we prevent things from going wrong. So the first thing that could go wrong is you can't intubate. 
and you should have a plan for that. So plan A is we're going to do this. If that doesn't work, we're going to do this. If that doesn't work, we're going to do this. And if that doesn't work, then we're going to do this. So plan A, B, C, D. Um, the other thing that could go wrong is cardiovascular instability. Most importantly, you know, in your preparation of the patient, you were trying to predict this. And then you should be looking at, can we actually prevent this? We should be fluid loading the patient, starting peripheral vasoactive drugs. But importantly, even with all that, they're still likely to have some instability on induction. So who should do what when it happens? Plan for it, anticipate it in advance, and don't be surprised by it. And then it's important you try and address any of the situational problems that may be there. So do I need to get an airway assistant or any additional equipment to come down from the intensive care unit to help intubate the child? Um, should I actually move the child to the intensive care unit and intubate them there if they're stable enough rather than doing it on the ward? Um, is there somebody who's causing problems in the team? Do I need to give them a job somewhere else to regain calm? the situation so there's there's lots of things to look at can can we prevent any of these problems from occurring is there any specialist help or equipment needed you've done your airway assessment and you think this is going to be a difficult airway but the child's managing okay the worst thing you can do is rush in and try and intubate that child without expert help and then i think really importantly at the end of your team brief when you've planned everything is asked does anybody have any questions or comments they need to make because somebody there may be going i'm not quite sure what to do should this happen or should that happen or actually are we doing the right thing with this should we not think about this so use your team use their wealth of experience uh, and give them an opportunity to ask questions and comments okay so that was a quick run through preparation for intubation preparing the patient, preparing the equipment, and preparing your team. And you've got the checklist, which is available freely on the website, pediatricemergencies.com, which provides a summary of this talk. And I would really encourage you to use a checklist um, the next time you're intubating a patient. Some people will say it's too much of an emergency. We just need to crack on and get the patient intubated. We don't have time for a checklist. But I would actually say to you, it's those sick critically ill patients where you can't afford for something to go wrong and the checklist is designed to help you prevent things from going wrong um, and i'll put a link to another video in the show notes which again might convince you that you can use a checklist in a true emergency okay so i hope you've enjoyed the talk if you're keen to learn more we are running our next pediatric intubation course in belfast on the 8th of june um, you can register for that on the pediatricemergencies.com homepage. There's a link in the sidebar on the right-hand side to the course. Thanks for listening.